Got it. Got it. Well, as we live and breathe, gentlemen, welcome back to the screen for yet another one for the SBAU. I am Baron Ron Heron, your host for the SBAU Astronomical Unit Hour or SBAU Astro Hour on YouTube and archived and welcome aboard. It's our weekly vlog and podcast for the South Coast Longtime Astronomy Telescope Club, which has been around here forever, done live uh, on Monday mornings, 11 to noon anyway, from our man caves and computer dens. And 11 to noon, I want to say uh, hi to a couple of friends of mine who've been with me for years. They have saved every one of the programs, Fred and Linda Ziesenheine. They're not in the club, but I do think they have a telescope. They're kind of shy. This week, we're going to talk about Jimmy's status. Jimmy being James Webb telescope, fine phasing going on out there. We'll look into the spring triangle. We'll talk about spring. There's all kinds of interesting things to learn about it if you didn't know. A naked eye double is actually a sextet. What in the world, President Jerry? I can't wait to hear you talk about that. The Parade of the Planets. I'm going to tell you where they are. There's at least four or five of them you can watch. And the gibbous moon. The heck is that? Big turnout for Westmont on Friday night, we'll talk about. And we'll also get into uh, President Jerry's forwarded silly science cartoons. Let's meet the president right now. Jerry Wilson, good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Happy, happy fourth term. Your wife, Pat, oh, thank you. is not exactly on the board, but doggone, she's welcome. She's around. She supports. She's in the club. Chuck McPartland, our outreach coordinator. Morning. Was saying hi to the local famous and well-known people out at Westmont on Friday night. Tom Whittemore used to be our connection there. He still is, I guess, Tom. Yes. Mm -hmm. Baker. I, I still have Westmont. the keys. <laughs> you still have the keys? <laughs> yeah. There's a guy named Ken you keep talking about. Is he your oh, connection? Yeah. yeah, Ken and I were upstairs for the outreach uh, on Friday evening. Uh, the Ken Tilstrom, so he retired last year. He was the chairman of the physics department pretty much all of the time I was there. Okay. Wow. Well, Tom Whittemore is married to Maureen. Chuck McPartland is married to our merchandise manager, Pat. And uh, whom, oh, Tom Totten is married <laughs> to Suzanne and our tease. How are you, Tom? Can't do this Good. without you. Our webmaster, technical wizard, be <laughs> number 56. We have done 56 of these programs. We're into the second year for March 21st, which is today through the 27th, which should be next Sunday. I guess the moon's on what waning side? Give us whatever that means. Mr. President, mm -hmm. before we go to your sillies, spring has sprung. Uh, you listed five points. Earth's axis is perpendicular to the ecliptic. Was it yesterday or today that? Yesterday. But I, um, um, I didn't like that phrase after I wrote it. The, I meant to say the, the sun is over the equator for the Earth. Yes. We'll find another way. The component is perpendicular, but not the whole thing. I seem to think of it as we're sideways to the sun. We're not full face on summer. We're not turning our oh, back. That's, yeah, that's that's a good way to think about the component. Yeah. Right. They and I are the same length. Vernal equinox was yesterday. That's the end of uh, mm -hmm. winter. And we're still got winter at night. Wait till you see one of these cartoons about the blankets. Uh, winter, let's see, it's the first point of Aries, except it's now in Pisces. Oh, look at that. Mm -hmm. Tom Totten, yes. you were just awesome. Yeah, I, we understand. What is the angle we're at, 23 degrees or 27? 23, 23 and a half. 23, 23 and a half, Ron. I'm sorry? 23 and a half. I just want to mention that, you know, yesterday the sun rose exactly in the east and it set exactly in the west. Okay. You know, that happens in March. It happens in September. Um and the way I like to think about it is from our point of view, the sun is now on its apparent motion crossing the celestial equator uh, towards the north. That's the way I think about it. Okay. Hmm. And the night and day aren't exactly equal length because of refraction from the atmosphere. So the equal, the actual equal day and night point is a few days before the equinox mm -hmm. because the atmosphere messes with it. <laughs> But does does the Earth not wobble over time? Would it change that twenty three and a half? Does it yep. go in and out? Yes, it, yes, it does, Ron. Oh, okay. The cycle yeah. is about twenty six thousand years. This wobble you're talking about. Well, what yeah, that, that's not a change in the angle. That's just where um, the angle the, point. The, the actual pole wobbles around. But the angle does also, I think, change over, over yes, yes, it slightly does. over long periods of time. 
Yeah. But yeah. If the axis is moving, that's the, uh, well, never mind. We're not going to get into details on that, but I assume <laughs> it doesn't uh, change winter and the, the seasons. No, it, it always stays the same. That's conservation of angular momentum. It's hard to respin the earth. And the other equinox is in fall. What is it called in September? Autumnal equinox. Seminal. Okay. Autumnal. 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 Okay. I didn't hear him. See, I'm kind of like the little kid inside uh, Mr. Wizard's uh, house on Saturday morning. Remember when we got up and watched, hey, Mr. Wizard, what's in yeah. the beer? What if I like this? You know, I'm the guy that does it. <laughs> and also, books are speakers. Incidentally, uh, Merrick. Brandt will be talking to us in a couple of weeks on our Friday, 1st of April meeting, which everybody, if you're watching this program, you're invited to uh, tune in on YouTube, I guess. We'll have um, our speaker and the rest of us, most of us anyway, that's on screen now. Tom, you want to do some of the sillies? Because there's some good ones. Okay, uh, let's see if I can find that. Throw it up and I might be able to match it because it's mm -hmm. easier to do that than you find what I'm yelling at. Pi versus imaginary numbers. That's a week old, but uh, it was on there. Simplified. Here we, go. Here we go. Which one is this one? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, patiently waiting for clear skies, the skeleton on the bed. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, no, sorry. There you go. That's some of us. <laughs> That's what happens there. when you buy a new telescope. Right. Yeah, and a paramount, a mount, that mount, Chuck, the paramount. Yeah. <laughs> That's what that is. That's a paramount. That's not a Dobsonian. No, 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 the mount is equatorial. Oh, the it's mount. Equal, it's, yeah. It, it's you, just paramount makes really, really elegant uh, mounts. Where do you look into the lens? Up on the top? Underneath? It's, right there. It's right there. Right there. It's, it's probably oh, configured yeah. for photography at, at that right. point. Yeah. <laughs> the Conians are not known for their convenient eyepiece location. Is that right? Yeah. So it gets it from the rear end, no, from the front to the rear, back to the front. All right. One, yeah. one, one thing about those paramounts, though, even though they're really, really nice, is they have a weird power supply. They want like 18 or 23 volts. That's about yeah. normal, isn't it, for a transformer? Well, oh, well 12, for... volt, tw 12 volts was easy. Most everything yeah. I've ever used is 18 volts. Yeah, 12 volts is the most convenient. Yeah. When, when uh, the summer science program was at Westmont for about five years, um, they had a clamshell observatory with a paramount mount. Uh, it was really nice. Okay. And we put, I think, I think we put a 14 inch or 14 inch SCT on that thing. Okay. And th th there's a whole story about uh, uh -oh. telescope. Oh, I'll, with I'll the mouse. Let me read this to you. Uh, this is anime, <laughs> you know, from Japan. I want to buy this telescope, but I don't need it. And his little friend's impulse says, just buy it. You're special and you deserve it. Okay, good point. What does self-control say? Well, he agrees. And he's tied up. And All right, so there's some advice, I assume, from SPAU to possible buyers. <laughs> Speaking of that, um, Tragic impulse, impulsive buyers that uh, well, Duff Kennedy and Tessa, they, they bought the five-inch that had just been donated, the five-inch SCT Celestron. And and then they bought a little laser to go with that. And then they bought a solar filter to go with that. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so they're, they're very good. The, the SBAU just got another 300 bucks from, from those guys, so. Nice. And on Sunday, uh, at the star party, there was a lady that says she has a Mead LX200 ACF eight inch uh, that she wants to uh, sell. So we can find somebody who wants it. Yeah, we're the, we're the dumping ground when you want to get rid of it. My blanket, when I try to find the damn thing alongside at 3 a.m., becomes, what is that, a mathematical fractal? Or the way the universe looks. Yeah, it happens. Green on the surface. Yeah, temperature profile, Ron. <laughs> That's amazing. We're all going through that. All right, Tom, thank you for that one. So, so Jerry, Jerry, you're saying that's a real uh, mathematical thing that re represents something, or what? It looks like a, a Riemannian surface. What? What kind of? What's Riemannian? What's that mean? Um, doubles back on itself. Yeah, and simply, simply, uh, I, I'm at a loss for words right now. Non-Euclidean yeah. <laughs> geometry type stuff. Yeah, non definitely non-Euclidean. Yeah, okay. 
Well, it'll, right. come to you. it'll come to you, Mr. President. Wow, a different error message. Finally, some progress. This one I didn't get. Slow, but steady. What is that? You about? haven't sat in front of a computer trying to figure out what's wrong with it. And you keep changing things. And all of a sudden, you get a different error message. And you take that as a faint hope. of, But uh, you take that as a sign of progress. You're desperate for progress. I see. It's kind of like check engine light. You'll never know what it is till you take it to the damn mechanic and then it's $500. Except here you're the mechanic. Yeah. So he's got, it had nothing to do with the fact that he's got two screens in front of him. <coughs> error no. message. Okay. Throw something else up, uh, Tom, or is there any more? I think that's it for the moment. We have the Asian mountain Buddhists. I and the Asians. Um, oh, I think I must, must have missed that one. <laughs> okay. Well, they're sitting in front of a large electronic resistor going home. Oh, I think we saw that last time. Oh, okay. we did? Maybe we did. So, Simplify. Guys, what? what? Ron, if you wouldn't mind me just spotting, uh, Gene Parker died uh, recently. Parker Pro was named after oh. Eugene Parker. Yeah, Solar I think he, physicist. Yeah. yeah, he was at University of Chicago for a number of years. That's and he was the guy that in the in the late 1950s said, hey, there is something called a solar wind. And a lot of people discredited him. And of course, he was proven correct. Yeah. Solar wind are particles that go, what, a million miles an hour? And sometimes they burst out and if they're dangerous if they hit us? Yeah, gen I, I'd say generally they take about two days to get to the earth from the sun. There, there's Gene Parker. He was a great, great physicist. He just passed away, or did he die before they launched his namesake probe? No, no, he, he actually away. saw the launch of the probe. So he okay. passed away, I, I don't know, it was in the New York Times. Um, that very photo was in there. Um, I, I don't know, the within the last week or two, Chuck? Yeah. yeah. We got uh, visitors all over the solar system, but this one just blows me away. I guess it's going around the sun like uh, Janet. What's the one going around uh, Jupiter? Uh, big, huge loops comes in close. You don't dare stay close like a million miles out from the sun. Yeah. Juno. And how in the yeah, world? The Juno. I guess it has to get far out before it can radio back because all that stuff you were talking about would disrupt any radio waves. I would imagine. What is this? What are we looking at? It's not so much that it disrupts the radio waves, but the radiation damages the electronic equipment. Oh, yeah. So it's trying to stay out of the radiation as much as possible, but still gets close. Yeah. You know what? Jim Jim Williams is just saying that he got his LUNT 60 millimeter solar telescope, but he's been busy and hasn't had time to do his first light yet. So uh -oh. hmm. got to wait. Well, Clear the sun's skies wrapping and, up in activity. Yeah. You know, the wind seems like, Jerry, is it like windy skies seem to affect the ability to get a good image as well, right? Even when you're looking yeah, at the yeah. sun. Poor, wind is poor seeing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it has something in common, I guess, with James Webb. They both have a protective barricade for something. One of them is that big uh, sun shield on the James Webb. And this one is really a sun shield, that Parker yeah, probe. Uh, hide Parker. behind it when you're close. And the Parker probe just did a, a flip by Venus and took some images and actually could look down through the clouds and see some surface features yeah. in the wavelengths it was using. And it periodically goes by Venus to help uh, bring it in closer to the sun yeah slingshot <laughs> yeah. Well, i remember that picture the russians took with the, one of their veneras that landed you could actually see rocks and the base yeah. of the spacecraft there it is there's the parker probe yeah for a few minutes you could before the spacecraft <laughs> yeah. fall. before the, the feet melted <laughs> i think the longest survival there on venus was 46 minutes or something like that well, does it have more stuff in its atmosphere to give it that much pressure? Why is it the same size planet as us, but why would it have higher density atmosphere? Just because Good questions. Good question. We'll have to take it up some week, gentlemen. Yeah, on the surface, it's like 3,000 feet underwater here. Yeah. Jeez, that's crazy. Could that happen to Earth? Well, Elon We're Musk. We're working on it. Elon yeah, Musk. Really, uh, just hang around. I got to settle there. <laughs> Can we uh, take on one of the last items in your long list, Mr. President, of uh, talking points? That would be uh, our first step out is the James Webb, a million miles away. They're still fine tuning it. In this case, what is it called? Fine uh, lining? Phasing. Phasing. Fine phasing. What does that mean? 
That well, means they're true. moving yeah. the surfaces. Go ahead, Jerry. No, go ahead. You got it. I was just going to say they're moving the surfaces so that the light waves reflected off of them are in phase, so they don't interfere with each other on the way to the secondary mirror. In phase, they, yeah. they're going to be the exact match sine wave, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're all going to contribute to the, to a, a gigantic paraboloid. And it looks like they're really there from the um, image. And you can start to see faint galaxies in the background start to show up. Is this a, is this picture here taken by the James Webb? Yeah, yes. this is taken by the James Webb. Recently, it's the latest shot that shows that, that they finished the fine phasing for that instrument. Now they're going to work on um, matching up the performance with what's required for the other four instruments, I think, up there. Jerry, is that the star that's in Ursa Major? Yes. OK. There's a lot of galaxies up there. There are. Yeah. It's a good spot. Yeah. So the next one's the remaining alignment steps before final science instrument preparations um, are the near field spectro infrared spectrograph, the mid infrared instrument, the near infrared, oh, you covered my thing. Huh. Um, let, me, let me get back to that. Um, the near infrared imager and the slitless spectrograph. Well, all those different infrared things, there's, you have to divide up the spectrum. It's that critical, that sensitive? No, these are different instruments that are oh. on the spacecraft. And when you point, when you put a new, if instrument at the focal point, you have to tip the whole thing. So they have to make sure they have the alignment right for one instrument. And then when they move over to the next instrument, they have to make sure that the alignment is of all the little mirrors are right for that instrument too. Okay. So they've done the first instrument. They've done the, um, let's see, which one is it? Really steps for the um, near infrared camera taking pictures. That's what this alignment is looking through. Oh, I see out in the front. Yeah. The the 18 portions of the telescope itself of the uh, hexagon, hexagons have all been tuned. They've all been, they've all been what? Yeah. Yeah, they they tune and they all they're all holding hands and cooperating. When you tip the mirror to point at a different instrument, you have to make sure the mirror alignments the mirror stays aligned. And so Jerry, are are you saying that they tip the, the big mirror towards an instrument, or maybe they tip a secondary mirror towards the instrument? It's probably I don't know sure they do, but I assume they would tip a secondary instrument. Well, boy, that fourth one, you don't want to play with that. The slitless, is that what it's called? Slitless, yeah. That's okay. where each each one um, makes its own. Well, it's just it's hard to explain. They're small objects, so it doesn't blur the image to have to have no slit on your spectrograph. Okay, but at the rate they're going, it's going to be June before it's fully operational and starting to work. That's their target date, yeah, by yeah. early May. And the Jimmy is what they're calling it for sure. No, that's what I called it. Oh, you called it the Jimmy. I, I said that. <laughs> All right, fascinating stuff. It always is. The things I learn, I just wish I could keep it. Uh, shall we talk about summer triangle versus the spring? Or we got a spring triangle. Uh, there's planets in the morning. There's a uh, proper motion of stars, which I had no idea. You're going to fill us in. The sextet instead of a double. Take your pick. So, oh, no, it's your, your show. Oh, that's right. I got to remember that. Well, let's talk about the planets because uh, Whittemore is good on watching. Uh, we got Mars, Jupiter, uh, Mercury. What are you looking at first, right before sunrise? A couple hours, right, Thomas? Uh, I think we've lost Mercury pretty much. You know, it's it, it's it's going to be really tough to see, but you can easily see Mars, and you can pick off Saturn. Um, I'm not sure Venus, about Jupiter. What and with Venus, Saturn, of course. Oh, v yeah, Venus. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Mars is magnitude one point two. Mercury and Jupiter can be seen just before sunrise about a point one point seven degrees apart. That's pretty darn close. Mercury yeah. passed just below Jupiter. That happened. Oh, look at this. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. Both are barely three degrees above the horizon, just 15 minutes before the sun comes up and washes out everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, you can see Mercury and Jupiter would be awfully tough to see now. Yeah, now this is our solar system. It doesn't show what you'll see in the morning sky. Okay. Uranus is also among... Here it is. It's near HIP 1230. Uranus is in the evening sky. Well, that's right. a nighttime watch. Okay, but that's five planets. And that Saturn is always there, right? You can always see Saturn? No. 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 Saturn's really? not in the morning sky yet. Yes, it is. Oh, oh, yeah. No, you can see it, Jerry. You can see oh, it. Is it? Yeah. So it, must be, it must be up higher than the horizon then. It went first. Yes. Is Neptune ever on the menu? Can you ever see Neptune? Or oh, Earth? yes. You can. Well, you need, a binoc you need binoculars. Yeah. You can't see it with your naked eye. Uh-huh. Right now, it's kind of lined up with the sun and Mercury and Jupiter, so it's kind of that same close to the yeah. sun, too close to the sun. Mm -hmm. Well, let's phase from that into the triangles. What's, how many triangles are there? Are there four-season triangles? <laughs> Bring Take any three stars. There's yeah, three I pointed out hexagons. To, yeah, I pointed out to Ken Kilstrom on Friday night the winter triangle, which is really pretty. I don't know if you, you can pull that up, Tom. It's um, Procyon, Sirius, and Betelgeuse. So they pick three stars and make a triangle. Is it a pretty close to an isosceles or a that that triangle, the winter triangle, is very much looks like an equilateral. Yeah. The summer triangle is in the faint dark blue or the faint blue lines. Well, this is this is the spring triangle here. Excuse me, yeah, spring triangle. I need more coffee. <laughs> we only see that in the spring. It'll go away later, or it just came up. Well, these it's stars visible. are only there in the spring. It's visible well through into the summer too. Right. Yeah, but it doesn't become the summer triangle. That's another no. one. It's overhead in a convenient time of the evening in the spring. Mm -hmm. Okay, here they are. They're probably actually far out apart. As one's deeper in space than the others, but oh yeah, line up nicely for us. Well, wow. can you see Ron? The the Botes, the Hunter is over here, and Arcturus is the the what mm -hmm. the tip of the the bottom of the Hunter, or actually, of course, we call it the ice cream cone, yeah. which is, <laughs> and then and there's Bote another scoop of ice cream that fell off over here, Corona Borealis. Botes is is a herdsman, not a hunter. Orion's the hunter. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, he's, he's hunting a bear, though, right? Yeah. Well, he's the Herdy. guardian of the bear. He's oh, hunting guardian. a rabbit. <laughs> you, can see, you can see our tourists now between 9 and 10 in the evening. Yeah. Oh, really? The others mm -hmm. going away? Or? No. It, it, it's, it's coming up between 9 and 10 right now. And Spike a little bit later. Mm-hmm. Now, Spike, a, Spike is part of Virgo, and I, I cannot see Virgo here. We're, we're, is it Spike is supposed to be part of the, the shaft of wheat that she's holding on to. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's right. And what? then Leo, the lion, uh, the nebula, mm -hmm. that's his tail. At the tail that's end of the lion. Oh, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. Deneb means tail. So Denebola is tail of the lion. And you can see the Leo triplet of galaxies right up there in the back leg. Mm -hmm. Down there. 65, 66. Yeah, the third one is there, but it's not listed, on, not labeled. Yeah, we call the third one a hamburger. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's more like a hot dog. Uh -huh. <laughs> what, what are all those little yellow words clumped together in the middle and upper right? What is the difference? SEA objects. That's the, uh, what you're circling now is the Virgo cluster area. Oh, it's a cluster. Those what? are Messier galaxies. Yeah. Gotcha. That's fascinating. Does every season have its own triangle? Probably if you want to be creative and finding one. Oh, I can find Remember, these are just um, apparent visual asterisms. That yeah. People know. Right. Yeah, basically any three stars, unless they're in a straight line, are going to give you a triangle. So make your own. Got it. I think in the wintertime, isn't there, isn't there a winter hexagon? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so some people call the, the triplet of... Um, uh, Sirius, Betelgeuse, and Procyon, a, a winter triangle. And I pointed that out to people on Friday night with the laser. Huh. And in Australia, they have the Southern Cross. How many stars does this cross take? Four. 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 Not one in the middle. It's, it's a pretty anemic cross. Yeah. Very small. It's not like Cygnus. 
Fantastic. So that's the spring triangle be with actually, us. Actually, the, the, the Southern Cross is the smallest constellation. Is it really? Think, yeah. We have a Northern it, Cross? Yeah, some people call parts of Cygnus the Northern Cross, but it's not a constellation. I got gotcha. you. Well, I surprised Jerry pointed out in his right up there about the size of Spica's uh, stars. One is, I mean, they're, they're right next to each other. And, the, and looking at their masses, one's 11 times the mass of the sun, the other one's seven times the mass of the sun, then they're, they're going around each other in four days. Yeah. So, so much, Jerry closer was saying than, that, much closer than Mercury's orbit, they're distorting each other. And football they, uh, shaped. And what? The, so they're yeah. football shaped. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, since you brought up a moment ago, Jerry, the uh, cluster, is there any way, this is nowhere near the Messier 3 that you mentioned, uh, after the gibbous moon sets, our spring season's best globular cluster is M3, a dense ball of stars. Uh, M3 in, is on this uh, map. Mm -hmm. It's out there near this, uh, southeast Canis Venetitia, or Ven Venetia. I see. What the hell kind is of the, the hunting dogs. I at the end. I'm sorry. It's near the border of Boatus Cluster, which Thomas just uh, mentioned, and it's halfway between the bright Arcturus and the herdsman back here and Cor Caroli in the hunting dogs. All right, we just passed through that moments ago. I should have. Well, it's Tom. Tom's got it up right now. There's Cor Caroli, mm -hmm. okay. and then there's M3 if you come down, and then below that is Arcturus. Yeah, it's almost halfway between those two stars. Yeah. And you can use magnitude four beta Comae Berenices as a pointer. Can you point to that? Just curious. M3 sits 6.7 degrees east of that star. Shines <laughs> yeah, this, there's nothing really bright in Coma Berenices. <laughs> 18 arc seconds. Use a small scope or binoculars. Discovered by the man himself. Messier. What was his first name again? Charles. 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 All right. He didn't uh, discover everything with his name on it, did he? Other people. No, didn't. no he borrowed some. Okay. So this is what you'll see in the um, southeastern, southwestern sky at uh, about 10 o'clock in the evenings right now. This week. So it's a nice placement for a warm evening. Okay. Look at this. Cor Corolla is also a great double star. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, most of them are doubles, but. All right. yeah. I forgot to show M3, the, uh, right there. Yeah. It's a beauty. It's a real beauty. Yeah, it's got a real bright characteristic white star next to it. Um, and it's got, it's dotted with all these red giant stars throughout it or in front of it. But I think they're part of the cluster. Right. Well, they go far out too. Yeah. Well, I've asked this before, but if our sun was in the middle of that, there'd be no night? No dark not, night. Not like we know. Yeah. It'd be a light night, wouldn't it? It'd be like our uh, underneath the streetlights here. Ah, yeah. I heard a new voice. That sounds like BKM. It is. Mr. Murdoch. Collector. Thank you for joining us. Oh, okay. Finally, it's, he wants my video. There we go. All right. There's another... Uh, well, normally it comes up automatically, but I, since you weren't coming up, I had to ask. Well, what? I have been fighting taxes in Pataki, one Prudential Insurance, trying to get a 1099 form for hours. <laughs> and it's just hopeless. <laughs> you should have told yourself that and joined us and just said, screw them. <laughs> well, I, I was waiting on the phone and I, I, time got away from me. I've been up since five o'clock this morning. That's when I always wake up. What's the gibbous moon, fellas? Just real quick. You know what that means, Mr. President? Gibbous means between, it's between the half phase and the full phase or, right. or, or yeah. new phase. It actually means humpbacked. Yeah. Yeah, it's a complement of the crescent phase. Okay, mm -hmm. so I, I would call it the taco phase. It looks like a taco shell, right? Yeah. <laughs> that works. Uh, incidentally, Mr. Uh, Outreach coordinator, there's Bruce's ugly picture. Thank you. <laughs> Remind me of Saturn with those headphones on your head. Uh, Chuck, you... Well, if I uh, use the speaker in my uh, uh, tablet here, it, it feeds back. <laughs> yeah, we remember. Yeah. Yeah. 
I assume Chrissy Cook might be watching, or maybe she's got her new job going. Listen, uh, did you occult a uh, asteroid against the star recently? A couple of nights ago, yeah. Larissa. Marissa? Larissa. Okay, that's the star. They don't. No, that's the that that's the asteroid. Asteroid had a name, but the star didn't. That's correct. And you? Well, you... the star had a catalog number. <laughs> okay. Do you video these things? Do you record yeah. them? Yeah. Are they in sbau.org? Can we? No, they're on the IOTA Reports website. So we can't archive them for everybody to look at. Well, Thinking out. it's pretty boring to just see a bunch of stars and then one goes away and comes back. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. How about a uh, naked eye doublet turning into a sex tat? You wrote about this in your talking points, President Jerry. Yeah. Uh, you look for Big Bear. I'll give Tom Totten time to call this up here. It's in Ursa Major after dark. The rear end of the bear forms the best known asterism of all the Big Dipper. Its handle depicts the bear's extra long tail. Second from the end is a double that actually is many, many, I guess. Magnitude two, Mizar? Well, visually, visually, you can see two of them. It's a visual naked eye double, uh, Alcor and Mizar. Mizar. Okay. <clears throat> okay, but it's they, uh, were, they were used as a vision test in ancient times, right? Uh, Mizar comes from an Arabic phrase that means the puzzle or the test, and Alcor means the answer. And so, if you could see those two stars, you could be an archer in the army, and if not, you were a marcher. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Well, how many stars are we really looking at? Are there <clears throat> even doubles or triples or trinary? Well, Mizar is a quadruple, and Alcor is a double. Quadruple. But that's, was that spectros spectroscopic? Yes. But if, means... if you look in a telescope, you can see that Mizar looks like a double. But then each one of those stars is a spectroscopic double. What does Mizar mean, do you know? The puzzle or the test. Oh, you just said that. I'm sorry. And Alcor means? The answer. Answer. The and then tent. down below, you see this little tiny star? That's called, okay, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Cydus Ludovicium. Um, and that star means uh, King Ludwig's star. There was an astronomer in Germany who, of course, noticed that uh, people got subsidies from the local royalty if they <laughs> discovered things. And so he claimed that was a planet that he had discovered and he named it after King Ludwig because he wanted to get a subsidy from, from Ludwig because he lived in that province or whatever in <laughs> Germany. And uh, pretty much all the other astronomers said, well, you know, planets move and uh, this isn't moving. And so he didn't get any subsidy. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was wondering how it came out. <laughs> yeah. What does the word Cetus mean? Star. Star. This means star. star. Okay, star. Thank you. Cetus. Cetus in Latin. Are there any binaries out there we could see with the naked eye? Alcor and Mizor. <laughs> yeah. Very loosely bound. You can see two, not one. Yeah. Yeah. Even the one that's four. Well, the one that's the one that's four is the one Tom's circling right now. So in a yeah. scope, you can see there's two there. Then you yeah. need a, a spectrograph to split the the two doubles there. God, you know, they'd have to circle like uh, electrons in an atom, I, I guess. How the world do they keep from colliding? Well, the, the distances are really huge between them, even even the ones that are close. I mean, even the two stars there in Spica that were four, four days, I mean, that's millions of miles. Mm -hmm. uh, Proxima's three. Yeah. So. Yeah. I was going to mention, Ron, that uh, often at outreaches, because this is such an easy target, if you take your small telescope and aim it at Polaris, you will see uh, a companion. Okay. Really? Yeah. Uh, you cannot see that with your naked eye, but you can see it with a small telescope. Um, and I often show that because you put your telescope on that and you can kick back for the rest of the night because it doesn't move much. You know, Polaris is our North Star. You suppose they're uh, gay couples or are they heterosexual couples? Never mind. Shut up. <laughs> It's curious. Well, the visual Alpha and Mizar are separated by 12 minutes of an arc. And the moon is 30 minutes of an arc in diameter. So it's more than a third the moon size. Yeah. One third the moon size. So it's it's 
it's a good double if, unless you have cataracts or something. Yeah. <laughs> or you're nearsighted. Or you're nearsighted, <laughs> yeah. It, so I, I Tim Crawford has glasses. a question. Oh. Yeah. Tim, Crawford's, Tim Crawford's asking, what is a blue straggler? Oh. In the globulars, most of the stars are old, okay? But there are some blue stragglers that look anomalously young. And it turns out they form when stars collide within the globular cluster and, and sort of form a new star. Yeah, they top off their tank with new material. Yeah. yeah. Those are stars we're looking at, not galaxies? Those are stars. Those are stars. They look like galaxies on the bottom. Do they have tails like galaxies do? Or well, that's, that's when, they, when they merge, there are all these gravitational tidal forces that are yeah. stripping gas the, around. The straggler kind of phrase comes from their position on the hertzsprung russell diagram. Wow. So let's go to proper motion. Okay, you're going to have to explain this. Let me just set it up with this statement. It's the astrometric measure of the observed changes in the apparent places of stars out there or other mm -hmm. celestial objects as seen from the center of mass of the solar system compared to the abstract background of more distant stars. What the heck does that mean? So that that just means, means the stars are moving. Right, it means the stars move slowly. Relative to each other. Right. There is, no, there is no real fixed background of the stars. So the, the as you can see down there, the proper motion was suspected by early astronomers. Apparently there's a reference to it by Macrobius uh, in AD 400. But somebody take over for me, gentlemen. Somebody's at my door. Hang on. Okay. Right. In 1718, Edmund Halley noticed that Sirius, Arcturus, and Aldebaran we're over half a degree away from the positions charted by the ancient Greek astronomer Hipparchus, oh roughly 1800 years earlier. I didn't, wasn't sure if you were here. <laughs> ah, it's my favorite counselor. Sorry, I'm back. I'm okay. Really back. <laughs> she didn't know I didn't put the sign up today. Go ahead, gentlemen. We're done. Uh, her name is Jeannie West. She's with hospice. She's here to claim me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where were we? Fill me in, gentlemen. This happens. Oh, um, Edmund Halley noticed that the stars move. Uh huh. Okay, but only if the space velocity <clears throat> is different than the radial velocity. You won't have any proper motion otherwise. Yeah, you have to have a transverse uh, velocity. Right. Right. And it's transverse velocity expressed as an angular velocity that we see, or angular motion that we see as, and we label proper motion. And as vectors, the transverse velocity, when added to the radial velocity, gives you the space velocity. So those are vectors. Gentlemen, give me 10 minutes. I'm going to come back and catch up on this. I'm going to talk to my guests for a second. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. Gonna, I'll try to mute Ron while he's gone well, I can, here. I can, mute, I can mute it if you want me to. Yeah, please. I'll, all right. Thanks. So I, I have another one I can show about your, your motion. There are, there. there are two short videos that you can show that I've listed under the vector Oh, I missed diagram. that. I missed that. I, I did ha find this, this image of the Big Dipper changing over time. Yeah, that's a projection. The other two are actual stars moving. A lot of movement in these stars. Uh-huh. That's over a long period of time, geologic periods. Yeah, that's a hundred thousand This is actually, there. this is plus or minus 50,000 years from today. Yeah. Pretty that's impressive. A geological period. And we seem to share a motion through space with those uh, center stars of the Dipper there that we're all sharing motion and Sirius. So it's part of the, what's called the Ursa Mo Major Moving Association. It's kind of like a homeowner's thing. Yeah. Anyway, um, go to one of the videos that I showed there. The URL. Was, I see the Wikipedia related here. Huh? Yeah. Okay, hold on. Let's see where the video is. Let's see, there's one Bernard Star. Changing. Yeah. Okay, let's try this one. And uh, got to share. 
So showing the years, 80, 1985 through 2005 and yeah. Bernard Starr. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom, another fast one's Piazzi's Flying Star. That's another real fast mover. Up See, this Cygnus. is this is Cygni. Yeah, that's it. That's Piazzi's star. Mm -hmm. And it's a pair of flying stars. <laughs> <laughs> I did an article on Ed Hat that, that showed the motion of both of these, both of these, Barnard Star and Piazzi Star over the course of a year. Oh. Okay. Oh, 2000, 2012 through 2020. Okay, eight years. Okay. And for Piazzi to measure this, he was in like 1800. That's pretty it's good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Early 1800s, Chuck. Yeah. yeah. Didn't he discover Ceres? Yes. Oh, okay. That was like 1801, I think. Something like that. Mm -hmm. 1800, 1801, right on the boundary there. Mm -hmm. hmm. Does this tell anything about stars' distance from uh, our sun? Well, obviously, the closer they are and the faster they're going, the more apparent motion we'll see. Mm -hmm. If it's real far away, we won't see much. Mm -hmm. And that was part of they were looking for parallax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's parallax, that has, parallax has to move back and forth over a year. These That's a really nice image you got, Tom. That's the one I actually used when I, I taught astrophysics at Westmont. I used that one. Yeah, this is Wikipedia. Yeah, that must have been where I grabbed it. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry got, got that one too. Let's mm -hmm. see. Show. Boom. Oops. There's a table I put in of the fastest. Yeah, I was just trying uh, to get oh. there. Oh, okay. Went the wrong way. Should be a JPEG. There it is. Okay. Now the MAS per year is um, micro. That's milli arc seconds, right? No, milli arc seconds. Thank you. Yeah. Milli arc seconds. Yeah. So this one, then Captain Star at 6505. That one, well, let's do the 5730 next to it, which is just the proper motion. That's 5730 um, arc seconds. Milli arc seconds. Yeah, yeah. so, arc seconds. Five, so it's 5.7 arc seconds. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I keep stumbling every time I try to use my brain in real time. <laughs> so so Barnard Star, Star is still looks like it's the champion. I thought it had been replaced, but I guess not. But Captain Star is really zooming, if you look at yeah. the radial velocity anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Signy is, is, is the... Um, uh, Piazzi's flying star, 61 yeah. Signy. Barnard's star definitely wins on the parallax. Yeah. Yeah. So the higher the parallax, the closer it is to us. Yeah. Right. And a parallax and, and of one arc second is one para one per per sec. Right. And and 61 Signy, their Piazzi star, that was the first one they measured. I think the first one they actually measured a parallax on successfully. Okay. And that might have been Gauss, Chuck. Or Fraunhofer or somebody like that. Or oh, using a Fraunhofer okay. telescope. Okay, so uh, yeah, spectroscopically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a great book called Parallax uh, that talks that. about all the attempts from Galileo onward. Because even back mm -hmm. then with Galileo, they realized that if the stars really were very, were distant, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the, the solar system were big, you would see a lot of parallax as the Earth went around the sun. Right. And so the fact that they weren't seeing parallax told them, boy, the distances to the stars must be really huge. Right. 
Yeah, and just a point out that, you know, you can see on that last column there, the distance the star is away is the flip of the parallax, mm -hmm. okay? And remember, don't forget a, a, a parsec is 3.26 light years. So if you, if you want light years, just multiply everybody on the rightmost column by about three roughly. Okay. All right. So should we hit another subject? Yep. Sure. Let's see what we got here. Uranus. Anything you want to say about Uranus? That'll that'll be low. Low in the West. Mm-hmm. Think... Discovered in 1781 by Herschel William. With his seven foot telescope, which actually was only about seven inches in diameter. <laughs> now this is the only HIP star that for me, it's easy to remember. It's one, two, three, four, nine. <laughs> and that's the thing in the uh, red bullseye with Uranus next to it. Uranus is the blue or the greenish dot, and the star mm -hmm. HIP is the in the bullseye. So it should be a, a spectacular uh, color object, color contrast object. Uh, Uranus is a, Uranus is a, a what a gray green and the uh, star is an orange star oh that'd be nice yeah yeah, yeah we pulled that uh, uranus we pulled in with the eight incher when it's you know appropriate for the season and it's a very beautiful mm -hmm. object you can see it is a ball you know you can see it yeah, the ball. yeah non stellar uh, the, coming up this year in august is the 200th anniversary of william herschel's death and so they're having <laughs> all kinds of um I guess you'd call them festivities uh, in Bath, England, and and in Slough, where where he in the places where he lived, mm -hmm. uh, and he was also a composer. So they're playing his music, uh, yeah. they're putting out replicas of the telescopes that he used, um, and they want to make they they have a group at Bath University that's making a digital model of what's called his three foot telescope, which was his most successful telescope. Here's the seven foot telescope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so the 20 footer was uh, like this. I think it had a 12 inch mirror and it's actually in the States at the National Air and Space Museum. So um, this guy, Charles Draper, that's uh, in, um, in Bath, that's trying to get information on this 20 foot telescope. I was actually able to connect him with Samantha Thompson who used to be at the Museum of Natural mm -hmm. History here that was in Javier, working with Javier. And she's now a curator of the National Air and Space Museum for Astronomers. So connected and they're sharing information on the telescope. Mm -hmm. It's on loan to the National Air and Space Museum from the British Science Museum. Wow. Now that telescope is a, if you stay on it, if that's a, an eight inch telescope, is that right? Like, like seven inches for the mirror, yeah. Seven inches, and what is it? It looks like it's about F20. Yes, it's pretty long focal length. It's it's seven foot focal length, and it's a seven inch mirror. Makes, yeah. Gentlemen, am I unmuted? That makes it F twelve, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. And he used eyepieces with super high uh, magnification, and nobody nobody knew how he was doing it because they were trying to grind the lenses, and he was basically dripping molten glass into water. And getting these little spherical. Oh, that's in. right. Yeah. And then he would try out the glass. You know, he'd try to throw away the ones that didn't work and keep the ones that did. And he was he was managing to get these huge magnifications, mostly empty magnification, but still pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can see if Tom, if you go back where you were, um, you can see his. Uh, he made a machine for grinding the mirror. And if you go to Bath, England, yeah, there it is. There's his, his mirror grinding machine to do the rough grinding, um, except it wasn't glass. It was uh, speculum metal. So it was tin and copper. And so they had a very hard time parabolizing. They didn't, they didn't quite know about the Foucault test and things like that that we have now. And um, the, you can also, when you visit Bath, you can go to the house that he lived in and see these things. It's now the, the Bath Museum in Herschel. And um, you can actually see in the back patio there's an area where the tiles are damaged uh, because they used to take this speculum metal and they would make a mold out of horse manure 
and they would pour the metal in there to form the rough uh, blank for the mirror. And uh, once when they did this, the horse manure hadn't been properly cured, hadn't dried, uh, and <laughs> basically they had an explosion and it damaged the tiles in the back. And there's his 40 foot telescope. Now, if you're taking a mirror that's say a seven inch diameter and at 12, the difference between a sphere and a parabola is probably much less than a quarter wave. Yeah. So he could he could go to a, use a spherical mirror to some advantage there. Yes. And also, you know, you look at this and you think, oh, that's a big Newtonian, but it isn't. He would actually stand with his head oh, right yeah. at the front aperture there and tilt the mirror so that the rays focused right where his eye would be. So he didn't have a secondary mirror. He would just stand there and look down the tube at the mirror. Uh, that's what he is. And he had to have assistants who would, you know, pull on ropes and pulleys to move the scope and to move the observing platform. How did he make his money? Uh, he, he got a pension from the king after he discovered Uranus. Yeah. Wow. And he, he also just... sold, he made and sold telescopes. He was, he was like the first, uh, I, I guess you'd say, mass producer of, teles of right. quality telescopes. So, so Chuck, I... Kill him. Chuck, there, there, there's a recent article, I think it's in Sky Telescope, about some, one night that he and his sister discovered all these neat objects by watching, when I say neat objects, I mean galaxies primarily, by watching these things transit through the uh, telescope's point of view when he put it on the meridian. Did you right. see that on the Chuck? Right. That's what he'd yeah. do. He would, he, would tilt the, he would tilt that tube to a given angle, which would give you your declination. And right. then he would just watch as things drifted through and he would call out when he saw things. Yeah. And his sister Caroline would be sitting nearby, you know, with a candle uh, <laughs> and, a, and a notepad and a clock. And she would be noting down the times that it passed through. And that's how they got the right ascensions. Right. OK. She was quite an observer, too. Don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah she discovered multiple comets. Mm hmm. Yeah, uh, there's there's an object I show at Westmont. Uh, it's it's an open cluster in the kind of the more the late fall early winter sky, and it's called Carolyn's Rose. Mm -hmm. Carolyn's Rose, it's really pretty. Am I back on, gentlemen? Yes. You are. Welcome back. All right, thank you. Sorry about that. I normally post a note outside on my door saying I'm in the middle of this, but I forgot this week and. <laughs> West decided to drop by. Uh, I had just one quick question about proper motion of stars, which you guys went through while I was talking to my guest. Is that not like the parallax view? It's different. The parallax is caused by our motion around the sun. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it would be the more closer stars, the distant stars aren't going to change much, right? Right, yeah. Right. Okay, so you guys covered that well. They're, they parallax, are moving, but you just don't see it, you know. Yeah, parallax moves back and forth. Proper motion just keeps moving in the same direction. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, well, that's, uh, I, got, I guess I missed most of that, proper motion of the stars. But we're not talking about movement over time. Yeah. Uh, Oh, sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. they, they change position. They're actually not in the yeah. same place. Show right. the two videos again real quickly, Tom. Okay. And, and yet those three sisters on the belt of Orion are, look the same as when I was five years old. Well, they're 1,200 light years away or so, <laughs> yeah. so you're yeah. not going to see much motion in those. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we yeah. got the so Uranus coming in with Bruce's uh, yeah, this lunar is the, eclipse. Uh, Lunar eclipse and Uranus is that uh, blue thing down around seven o'clock, eight o'clock. Uh huh. Okay, what is this a star or not? Uh, that's not the moon. No, planet. Which that's the planet moon Uranus. and the planet Uranus. Yeah. Oh, it's our, it is our moon, uh, the, the bright one. Right, moon. this was taken at Westmont. Oh, it was? Yes. Was it a gibbous moon? No. No, it was, oh. a, no, it was a full moon because it went, it's. Well, um, gibbous is half, right. Right, you only get uh, uh, eclipses at full moon. We say half lit, moon. Lit. We say a lit. half moon when it's actually a quarter of the moon that's lit, isn't it? Because we're watching right now. That that's a half moon. The other half is on the no. other side. It's well, no, no. right now in the real moon, yes. But in this picture, yeah. that was a full moon. Ah, yeah. okay, gotcha. That was taken eight October twenty fourteen. By you? Yes. Yeah. With my uh, eight inch scope. 
I, I remember I was there. You were there, Chuck. There were yeah. hundreds of people, hundreds of people at Westmont. <laughs> well, That's I before say, COVID. <clears throat> yeah, you know, we have, we have a total eclipse coming up in May, and I haven't been hearing back from our normal oh, venue. Fine. I'm going to have to call them on the phone, but uh, we may, we may want to try to do the total eclipse in May at Westmont, if possible. Sure. Okay. Be fine. Yeah. Lunar eclipse. I oh. Okay. Yeah, Chuck. Lunar eclipse. Yeah. 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 Solar eclipses are rarely involving telescopes. It's something that blocks out and you see it on the wall or something, right? Yeah. The solar here's, the, here's the proper motion demonstration here, Barnard's star run. What does that mean? What are you saying? Oh, this is, oh. It throws its position at different dates. So we're, we are seeing it move. Oh, yes. yes. But this is proper motion, not parallax. Yet none of the other stars around it on that screen are moving at all. Oh, they're, moving, the background. they're moving so slowly you can't notice it. Yeah, I, I can see two of them moving, Jerry. Yeah. Huh. I'll be danged. Well, that was the first proof I've ever seen of people saying, yeah, it's moving. When you can't see anything moving, really, literally. You have to do it with photographs. Time, you know, yeah. taken. Galaxy <laughs> years apart, like Barnard's every five years. Is that a binary on the right? Well, it's both. the same same it's... pair of stars, and it, yeah. they're moving through eight years of time. They're they're a binary pair moving together. Uh, one's one's more magnified than the other. Right, right. But during those eight years, they don't get closer to each other, go around each other. They stay apart like that. Yeah, they're apparently their orbital motion isn't that much. Okay. How That's many, how far apart they are. Yeah. They use. And on the left, what, is that the same thing on the left? Yes. Oh, I see. Got you, right? Okay, got it. Proper motion of the stars. Okay. Mm -hmm. so uh, I have a couple questions uh, from our chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jim asked if there's a good online catalog that shows diagrams and periods of binary stars. Is one. Does anybody know of it? anything that shows the uh, diagrams of binary stars? A good reference. There are plenty of catalogs, um, like the Washington Double Star Catalog, um, that may you know people may have made diagrams from those. You, if you look for um, Parima for Gamma Virginis, I think you'll see a lot of diagrams of that, and that's actually I think near a wide point now, so it's easier to to watch. Well, do you suppose out there in a globular cluster somewhere might be the epitome of, of not binary, not trinary, but let's say 12 stars moving around or 10? Or what's the maximum? What's the record? Does anybody know? Well, it all depends on their distances from each other. You could probably construct something that's quite large that still works. Yeah, like a galaxy. Yeah, but it would be pretty contrived. Well, a globular cluster, they're all sandwiched in there together aren't they They're gravitationally yeah, you think, bound yes you can think of them as a great big you know half a million star system if you want they never hit each other no they do that's where you get the blow oh you wouldn't even know it and there's so many of them well uh, wouldn't it wouldn't it explode like a supernova having two bodies that size collide that's they could they could, but these are low mass are. stars, Ron. And these are low mass stars, and you can still have a couple of them collide and not go over the, the yeah. mass limit. Yeah. So they're mostly red dwarfs. Yeah, and that's where you get well, not necessarily red dwarfs, but but red and and well, sun the dwarfs. You could sort of say they're red dwarfs. Okay, I wonder why if they're all red dwarfs, why it's not a red globular cluster. <laughs> well, quite a few of them have red stars in them. Yeah. Okay. M3 we just looked at had a lot of red stars in it. Oh, it did. How about red? Uh, they'd never get a Betelgeuse, though, a red giant, though, couldn't survive and swallow everything up, wouldn't it? They were in the middle. Well, no, it's not that big, Ron. I mean, it, it's big relative to our solar system, not, but not big relative to these objects. Uh -huh. You have red giant stars also in galactic clusters. They're, all massive, they're old, so all the really massive stars have tended to already evolve off and blow up. Yeah. Betelgeuse didn't go yet, though, did it? We're waiting. 
<laughs> well, aren't there two kinds of red stars that kind of like betel juice where they burp off their outer layers and there's other kinds that are just they didn't have quite enough gravity to uh, do more than to get red right the red dwarfs are the ones that are the low mass and then right, red right, giants right. red giants are like aldebaran and like we're going to be and then red super giants are like Betelgeuse. and they're going to blow up in core collapse supernovas yeah or direct collapse supernovas and Betelgeuse is a variable as well. It goes bright and dim and bright and dim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Down to the wire, gentlemen. Anything we want to talk about the future? The night of the first is a Friday, a couple Fridays away. We're going to gather, I guess, virtually on screen again. Mm -hmm. uh, Merrick Brandt, as far as we know, not the son or a relative of a Professor Brandt we had speak to us years ago. I forget. I booked him. Was he a UCSB professor? Yes. He was? Yeah. They might be related. He's going to be representing LCO, which is Las Cumbres Observatories, and also touch on his take on exoplanets. I cleared this at the board meeting outside Palmer Observatory on the museum grounds the other night. A couple of Saturdays ago, we had a fascinating, wonderful, well-attended, how many people? Five, 800? 518. 518. 518. Who is this? Who are we looking at? That's your speaker. Eric Brown. Oh, is that him? That's yeah. Him. Great guy. Uh, Tom Totten, he asked to know how to uh, watch last week's show because he got my yeah. email saying, check us out a little late. Yeah, I sent it to him. He, he, he got it. Okay. He'll be watching us and know the score and just totally uh, regale us on the night of the first. We're back at noon. This sucker is over and doggone, I guess you can see it. How do you see it? Go to sbau.org. Yeah, yeah. Click on the link to take you to the YouTube channel. Okay, and you've already sent out the posting on email on for the membership on how to join us in two Fridays, as well on YouTube, right? For our uh, meeting. Not yet. Not on that Friday. No, we haven't sent that out. Yeah. All right, Tom. If if you if you would like to get together with me to uh, at Westmont to make sure those bolts fit before the next outreach, I'd be happy to help you. Okay, I'll let you know when I find uh, other bolts okay. I need. Okay. Thanks. And Great. It's early to, to uh, post your order for uh, sourdough bread from Tom Whittemore's Kitchen. Don't got it. <laughs> Program. Hope you like, hope you like <laughs> All right. Say hi. And, uh, say hi. You're living with your wives, but uh, give our love to your wives. And we will all do this again next week for number 57. That's the 56th edition till the 20th. Good morning and goodbye. And thank you very much. Uh, stay warm, especially at three o'clock in the morning, gentlemen.